Hey, welcome to another episode of Mushroom Wonderland. Aaron Hilliard here. I'm the Vice President of the Kitsap Mycological Society, and I'm also the creator of Mushroom Wonderland here on YouTube. And uh, today I'm sitting down with the infamous Dr. Michael Bugue. Um, he was a professor at Evergreen State College for a number of years, and his name is published in all kinds of mycological literature. And if you're anybody who's anybody in the mushroom world, you got to know who Michael Bug is. So I'm really thankful to be able to sit down with you today. Okay, let's get at it. Cool. So. Welcome to Mushroom Wonderland. Get to know the mycologist. So, what got you into mushrooms? What was your introduction to mushrooms? Well, I mean, I was a toadstool kicker, and I don't like the agaricus that you buy in the store, you know, the white thing, and <laughs> had zero interest in mushrooms. And then in graduate school, I was newly married, didn't have any money, and somebody gave me a bag of morels. Mm. And my wife and I cooked those up. It was like New York cut steak. It was uh, meaty, incredibly umami delicious. And I just, oh, I've got to, I got to have mushrooms. I'm in my 20s when I started. Uh, in fact, I would have been 24 when I started mushroom hunting. When I began, the, the first mushroom club in uh, Washington State and Oregon was just forming, the Puget Sound Mycological Society. I think wow. it was formed in 1966 or 65 by Daniel Stuntz, who was the professor at Evergreen State College, and Ben Wu, who was a, an architect in Seattle, and Dixie Lee Ray, who later became governor of the state of Washington. Wow. The three of them set this up. I'm enthusiastic about mushrooms, but there's no information. And I'm out steelheading it on the Elwha River. And it's a gorgeous river, it was down by the mouth. And there was all of these gorgeous red mushrooms with these little white dots on the top. <laughs> and so I picked, my wife and I picked two grocery bags of those and, and took them back to the UW campus. And we were both chemistry majors. At, and it's the the pharmacy department shared the same building and the leading toxicologists on mushrooms were in the pharmacy department in all of North America. And yet, I couldn't find anybody who could tell me what we had found. And it's such a new science, it right? It's such I mean, a new science. So you started the mycology program at Evergreen State College? Yeah. Wow. I sat in my office and waited for students to come and say, what. and six students came and wanted to study ethnomycology. Cool. What is ethnomycology? Well, uh, it's basically the historical use of mushrooms by particularly Native American tribes in our case that, that the students were interested in. But also, there were theories uh, R. Gordon uh, Wasson had proposed that in his book, Soma, the Divine Mushroom of Immortality, yeah. that Christianity was based on, on mushroom, uh, and muscari, which yeah. is that mushroom, the red mushroom with the white caps. and. So it all ties back all together, connecting. it all's connecting. So right away in the, that fall, Paul Stamets, Jonathan Ott, and Jeremy Bigwood, all three show up at my office along with about seven other students who wanted to study mushrooms, specifically psilocybe mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And I said, what are psilocybe mushrooms? They weren't mentioned in any books. I, I don't fully understand how it was so easy for one of those students to get me a Schedule 1, Schedule 2, Schedule 3, Schedule 4 drug license and a prescription booklet mm -hmm. and get the DEA to provide me with pure psilocybin and psilocin. Wow. And so we spent the next six years researching psilocybin and psilocin, where it was in mushrooms, what mushrooms had it, how variable it was. So these students, Paul Stammons, Jonathan Ott, uh, Jeremy, Bigwood. Jeremy Bigwood, they're out discovering psilocybe mushrooms, bringing them back to you at, at the and mycology lab. And we're naming lab. them. Yeah. And we're doing the chemistry. I really think that psilocybin 
is the most important drug for dealing with mental depression. Mm -hmm. They have about a 70% cure rate with PTSD, sometimes just with one session. Wow. If you've got alcohol abuse problems, if you've got, uh, you need to stop smoking, you need to stop drinking. Yeah. There's nothing better than psilocybin. And it turns out that microdosing, which doesn't involve these intense visual trips, right. works pretty much as well as the full tripping macrodose. I had been working on this much, doing the research for 10 years, and I never put one in my mouth other than to see what it tasted like and then spit it out, because yeah. that's part of the identification process. And my students kept saying, look, you've got to know, you can't keep talking about the mushrooms, you've got to actually experience them. Paul Stamets and others organized the first international mushroom conference in 1976. And there was one every year up until approximately 1985. Wow. And at that 1985, I said, okay, I'm gonna try them. And Kit Skates really wanted to know what they were all about too. And she's yeah. my mentor. She's about 20 years older than me. So I collected 100 Liberty caps. Ooh. Uh, on the Somehow. Evergreen campus uh, and drove to Brighton Bush for this big international psychedelic conference. Mm -hmm. you know, and everybody, if, if you're connected with the psilocybin world at, in 1985, you were there. Yeah. So it was this big conference. I'm staying in an old cabin. I'm, it was a two bedroom cabin and I'm sharing it with Gary Lindkoff and Linnea Gilman. <laughs> They were in the one room and I had the other room. It was about 7 p.m. and we just had dinner and it, and it was time for the evening talks to start. And Terrence McKenna was going to be speaking about how philosophies were actually be invaders from Mars come to <laughs> yeah, educate us and, you know. And so based on my reading of R. Gordon Wasson's uh, experiments in, in Mako published in the 19, May, May 1957, Life magazine. I calculated that 15 Liberty caps would give us exactly the same amount of psilocybin. Liberty caps are powerful. They're, they're, they were one percent in those by dry weight psilocybin, no psilocybin, That's true. and very consistent. Yeah. In those days, psilocybin cubensis could be anywhere from 0.2 percent to 1.2. Mm -hmm. Now they've got strains that are. 1.4 and above and mm -hmm. maybe even 2%. But I picked the Liberty Caps because I, I would know the exact dose and that I would be exactly matching it to what Wasson had. So Linnea, Gary, uh, Kit and I took the mushrooms and Maggie was the observer. Uh, so we took the mushrooms. Your and, guide. Huh? Yeah, she was, she was our safety, I think would be the best word. And we have about 25, 30 minutes. I mean, Gary and, and Linnea were just tripping. And so they went off to McKenna's lecture. And Kit and I are looking at each other, nothing. Everything's absolutely normal. So we said, okay, let's do 30 more each. Oh my Lord. So um, we did 30, 30 more each. <laughs> and we wait, and we wait. Should have hit us. Nothing. We had about 60 left, so we ate them. And then we waited a while. I said, well, let's go over to Terrence's lecture. And I'm sitting, we're, Kit and I are sitting there, really disappointed, just totally yeah. bummed out. And so somebody was handing around a whole bunch of psilocybe cyan essence. Yeah. So I ate a dozen of those. Now those are around 2% psilocybin and psilocybin. So that's equivalent to two dozen more. Yeah. Liberty caps. They're bigger and stronger. And, and they also have norobiocystin and a few other, they're a more visual mushroom mm -hmm. than Liberty caps by themselves. And I'm getting really bummed that nothing's happening. And somebody was standing on the deck, there's this big porch of this beautiful old building where the lecture was being held. And he had a bag of psilocybe cubensis. So I took a double handful of cubensis <laughs> out of the bag. Yeah. And I munched those down when we were walking Kit and Maggie back to their cabin. 
And then I went over to David Repke's cabin because he was researching Norbeo system while I was working on Silicon. And we're both wine lovers. And I'm, I've been a winemaker. I was a winemaker for 52 years. Mm -hmm. I actually started making wine before I got into mushrooms. And um, so we had three bottles of, of this David Bruce, just these incredible reds. Everybody else in the cabin is tripping. It's very mellow and He's quiet. He's got some tolerance. He had two pounds of shrooms and three bottles of wine. He's just functioning normal. So I walked back to my cabin. It was kind of a drizzly thing. And I said, well, I guess I may as well just go to bed. I'm out of mushrooms and then enough wine. So stuffed with psilocybe mushrooms. <laughs> Yeah, I closed my eyes. Isn't eating that many raw mushrooms dangerous? Like, I was told that I was eating. told that I would throw up or something. Yeah, um, and I didn't know then how bad it was to eat that many raw ones, but they tasted great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> enjoyed them, uh, and I didn't get it all queasy, like they said I would, and so stomach I went, of iron. I went to sleep and left the planet. <laughs> Yeah. And the work that Paul Stamets was doing on our scanning electron microscope that Alex Smith would come regularly to campus because he didn't have access to one at the University of Michigan. Uh -huh. yeah. um, it has a false color image and there was this beautiful blue. Uh -huh. So my visions were this same beautiful blue cool. of these SEM photographs that Paul had been taking. Wow. And it was gorgeous. I was getting too far away from the planet and was starting to leave the universe, and I wasn't quite sure where I was going to wind up. <laughs> yeah. I was getting a little scared, quite honestly, but I knew, yeah. well, there's, I can't kill myself on these mushrooms. There's no normal LD50. I'll be okay. And I opened my eyes. As soon as I opened my eyes, everything was normal. You can't die from eating too many psilocybin mushrooms? No. No normal LD50. What does that mean? It's the safe, lethal, lethal dose, dose 50. in 50% of the population. No, no, no. No, no, no. LD50. Okay, okay. There's no other drug like it out there. Right. It's also anti... You You don't get addicted to it. In fact, it quits right. working if you try and abuse it. Makes it makes you re repulsed at yeah. some extent. Yeah. So, I wasn't worried about any of those aspects. Yeah. But to be able to just shut it off like that, I, I'd never heard of that. I didn't, wasn't trying to shut off, just I was scared. I woke up and everything was normal. You just snapped out of it? No, as soon as I opened my eyes. Oh, okay. All I had to do was open my eyes, get up, got dressed, went over, knocked on Maggie and, and Kit's cabin, and Maggie just begged me, I want some more mushrooms. You've, you, you've had the experience and I missed it. She had five times as much as it should have made her eye, and she never got it. Really? Some people, never it's tripped. like that. Some people, yeah, it's like that. Never tripped. I had I went to ten times. Yeah. And um, and tripped while you slept. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so I, we went back to my cabin, Maggie and and and, Kit, and by then Gary and Linnea had come back from the from the hot tubs, and they came in, and so I laid down, pulled the sleeping bag over my head, and I narrated the visions to them. So yeah. I told them what was happening, and when I felt I was getting too far away, I would wake up open my eyes, everything would be normal. Yeah. And after a while they all got tired and went to bed. And the visions continued for exactly six hours after I'd eaten the last mushrooms. And I sort of went, ah! and I relaxed and went to sleep. Everything was normal. It was over. Wow. For the next fifteen years I thought doing those mushrooms is the biggest mistake I ever made. Huh. But what I didn't recognize it changed me for my entire life mm -hmm. to a much more caring, empathetic person. I don't need to do it again. Last summer, I did start microdosing. Mm -hmm. I did it for four or five months, and I said, eh, I don't need this. So you pretty much have only experienced it one time. One you know, time. Okay, interesting. So he's kept it pretty science, even though you're kind of the Pacific Northwest godfather of mycology, your professor, Daniel yeah. Stuntz, has a psilocybin mushroom named after him. The Boy, Jonathan Ott. Okay, Jonathan Ott named this species of mushroom, we call it a blue ringer, 
Uh, it's the Psilocybe Stensii, right? Yeah, it's a very weak, bluing Psilocybe. No, I hear people say that. So here, I gotta... but, but my son said it doesn't matter that it's on the weak side. I, I've done the chemistry. I know yeah. exactly how strong it is. This is. But you can find so many of them. Right, it's, right. That's not an issue. There'd be like 10,000 of them growing right outside of Dr. Stunz's office. Yeah. He was furious to have that. So he was so mad at Jonathan Lott. For naming it off? Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> he did not like that. I mean, in the mid 90s, right. we discovered these, all these new tracked homes were going in. Yeah. All of their new lawns were getting oh, sawed. Oh, and these oh, mushrooms were everywhere. Oh, and yeah. we were just filling. I mean, I remember taking my shirt and having it so full. So my first experience was four guys. We picked as many as we could possibly stuff in our hats. Yeah. We made one pot of tea that boiled down to four cups, and we lost our minds for like well, 10 sure. hours. It was insane, right? There, what, there's do you not know? much psilocybin per mushroom, but we need a yeah, lot of mushrooms. Four pounds of them and four <laughs> cups of tea. Yeah. But my question is, do you know why were they so prolific during that time? And then they seem to have like disappeared. Everybody that's my generation goes, Oh, the Blue Ringers, yeah, the Blue Ringers were everywhere. They were there for a couple years, and then they seemed to go away. A lot of people thought, there's fungicides, the neighbors hated us in their lawns. I think they ran out of nutrition, perhaps well, they came know, in the sun. For a while, Psilocybe Bioassistance was everywhere. Yeah. It was one of the most, but I remember Governor Dan Evans calling me up on the phone, asking me what all the kids were doing outside his office in the, in the, uh, in the beauty bar, because this yeah. is a beauty bar associated by sure where the, the stuncii tends to be on lawns. So I used to tell people, oh, you want some stuncii? I just go to the local grade school or <laughs> in courthouse. One, and one day the, the prison out in Shelton called me up and says, how come all the inmates are spending all their time on their hands and knees out in the, out in the yard? Oh, wow. <laughs> Could you imagine that? In the prison on mushrooms? That'd be a double nightmare. That'd be the worst time ever. <laughs> Do you feel it's responsible and safe to perhaps legalize psilocybin mushrooms like they've done in Colorado, just anybody can possess them? you think that that's safe and a good idea? Well, it's a lot safer than alcohol and guns. Right. <laughs> so, um, from an addiction standpoint, you don't have to you worry about you that. You won't get addicted. People aren't dying unless they're doing stupid things while they're under the influence. Yeah, and yeah. That's, that's the only threat. And the other thing is, I've been around 150 people all tripping at the same time, and it's mellow, quiet, peaceful. I would not want to be around 150 drunks all at the same time. <laughs> it's dangerous and unpredictable, and then, right? Yeah. So you have something that's extremely dangerous, and it's legal, and something that's risky, yeah. but is highly penalized. Yeah. It makes sense. And Schedule One means no useful medicinal use. Right. And here we're dealing with one of the most important medicines out there. It's the safest, way safer than ketamine or all these other things that they're using. Ketamine will have similar results yeah. in changing people, but it's way more dangerous. And mushrooms are considered Schedule One. Yeah, they're Schedule One. And heroin is Schedule it's, Two, from what I understand, right? Oh, it's I, uh, considered a, med, a has medical value. Oh, so I see. They put it on schedule two, where they said cannabis and and uh, and psilocybin mushrooms don't have any. Yeah, and cannabis purpose. does have some medicinal. I much prefer psilocybin, yeah. even to cannabis. I, psilocybin is a lot safer. Cannabis can have some really adverse long-term mental consequences that I'm not aware of with psilocybin. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. interesting. So it's kind of a wonder drug in a way. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's Dr. Bugue's take on magic mushrooms. That's so cool to share with us. Uh, if you're not familiar with Dr. Bugue, he's got a new book out, right? Mushrooms of Cascadia. An illustrated key. An illustrated key. So it's a dichotomous key. It's not just. It's not just any old book. It's, it's not just. But it's designed to make any old book that you have work much better. Yeah. I actually okay. recommend using it in conjunction with your favorite other book. Awesome. Or use it in conjunction with the free Mycomatch program, which you can download. Uh, it's called mycomatch.com. It's a product of the Pacific Northwest Key Council. And there's an app that goes on your smartphone for that, right? Yeah, but that, that app is more limited. Okay. The full-scale okay. thing, if you download it to your computer, 
gives you 6,000 images of Northwest mushrooms covering over 2,000 species. Wow, awesome. Yeah. So how do, we, how do people get a hold of your book, real quick? Well, it's www.mushroomsofcascadia.com. Okay. And right now, one of the few places that still has it in stock is uh, Fungi Perfecti, Paul oh. Stamets Company. Cool, awesome. So I own the book. My daughter has a version of the book. I love collecting mushroom books. This is definitely one that I use. And I just want to thank you again for meeting up with me and uh, for Mushroom Wonderland and uh, Dr. Michael Bugh. We'll see you guys on the next episode. Much love.